right now for the podcast listeners only, we're offering $5 off each ticket purchased on Formula Drift website by using FD Podcast when you check out. That is FD Podcast. I don't know if you need to capital the FD, but try it either way. So head over to formuladrift.com, pick up the tickets, then enter code FD Podcast, get $5 off all eight events this year. So 20 a season, head over. If you're going, save five bucks, might as well. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Outer Zone. My name is Jacob Gettens, and we have James the Machine Dean, or the Tire Slayer Dean. You've had a couple of nicknames now over the years. Yeah, quite a few. Um, but yeah, once they're good, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, is it? I'm uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's good to be on this. I know that we've been uh, trying to do it for, for quite a while, and this is my first weekend off in, I think, seven weeks. So... Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I feel bad for canceling on you. I mean, you you definitely made it known at Grid Life, making fun of me for, for doing that. But uh, <laughs> no, it's all I, good, man. It's yeah. all good. I I I can't even comprehend your travel schedule. I mean, especially over the last what five years, like it's crazy. Yeah. Um. So seventeen to nineteen, I did three championships each year. Um. So I think I did nine in a row in three years. And it was insane. So when COVID actually happened, it was terrible, obviously, but it gave me a little chance to uh, to catch a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, I think that if there's any positivity that came out of it, I think a lot of people got a chance to, um, where, where were you, I guess, like, where were you when that all came down? Like, it, uh, it, I think it was alluded to in that one video, but like, what, you had a lot of plans for that year. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of plans. So I was just after finishing the, Oman International Drift Championship. So that was at the start of 2020. So we got three rounds in and we heard about this COVID thing and wasn't really sure, you know, was it going to be serious or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget, my dad was actually saying this could be serious. And uh, myself and my partner Becky at the time, uh, we were like, ah, I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know. Is that really going to change things? And it did. Um, so we had full plans. We The White House team were after rebuilding the cars in Poland. Um, everything was, you know, prepared to be shipped back to the US and all guns were blazing to return in 2020. And uh, yeah, it all kind of just happened really quick. Um, travel bans, you know, all the team was based in Europe. And yeah. uh, before we knew it, our plans totally changed. Yeah, it. I mean, I think it threw a lot of people for a loop. I mean, it would have been incredible to see you go for a like a four peat um but I, it almost makes the story better like now that there is that gap like the return and everything else and obviously the the change to rtr like i just mix the whole story up pretty crazily for sure and it's something which i personally enjoy the new challenge and you know being out of my comfort zone it's uh it's exciting because yeah. to be honest at the end of 2019 i was like oh my god like we've had such a run like, what do we do now? Like, I actually felt a bit weird uh, after Irwindale in 2019 for for a few months. I was like, how do we come back from this? So yeah. it, uh, yeah, it wasn't ideal, obviously, COVID, but it kind of gave us a chance to um, sit back, think about the future, uh, try some new things. And yeah, it's it's all worked its way out in the end, pretty much. Yeah, there, there's a, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, but it's called jumping the shark, where it's basically like once you've, you've kind of done something so big that like, how do you, how do you, what do you do from there, right? Like 2019, especially just that, that whole year for you was insane. And then yeah. it's like, okay, do I like try and win four championships in a year? Like, do I, do I, so I compete in every single series in, in the world and try and win a championship? Like, yeah, like when we came to FD, Winning the championship was not the target or the plan. It was like, right. my my dream was, oh my God, I just want to one day stand at that podium and hold one of those carbon fiber trophies. Like I wasn't coming to, you know, coming to dominate yeah. or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever happened. Um, but we, we came on to Long Beach, brand new team, new cars, new everything. Uh, obviously, I, I've been to FT what was it, seven years previous with, yeah. with Falcon and the S15 for four rounds. So that was my only experience of FD. So the game had totally changed. Um, we were like, what are the cars going to be like? So many questions and things like that. But I knew that 
I remembered Long Beach and I loved that track when I was there back in 2010. So mm -hmm. uh, things just went way better than we ever expected. Qualifying second behind Vaughn and winning the event outright. Just, yeah, still to this day, favorite event I've ever done. Really? Huh. Oh, like by far. It was just amazing because there was so much hype. Um, like Ireland had my back so hard and they were saying... You know, there was just loads of stuff on the internet and oh, they, were, yeah. they were like, I, here's your problem now, FD, you know, um, and uh, <laughs> some of the Irish drivers were happy to see me go, um, but <laughs> the, in, a, in a positive way because I know, I know. <laughs> they, they felt like I would be a great representation of IDC and the great drivers we have in Ireland and uh, the great drivers we have in Europe. So I had huge support going there in 2017. I didn't feel crazy pressure because, you know, there was nothing to whatever happened. You know, if you have a good result, it's a bonus. If you don't, mm -hmm. you're learning from it. So we just went there feeling excited and felt really comfortable in the new car. And yeah, just it all really came together way faster than I ever expected. Yeah, I remember when the announcement came out, I mean, obviously just being the drift nerd that I am, uh, I had already had a pretty good background as to what you were capable with. And there was a lot of people like, oh, you know, the, well, the street circuit with all the walls, like that's not really something that he's had to deal with before. And then it was like, you came in, crushed that. And then it, then it became like, oh, yeah, but once he gets to a bank, like it's not like he's got a lot of experience on a bank and then you crush the bank. And then it's like, okay, but but Atlanta, like it's going to be way too fast for him. Like he's not used to this. And then it was like, crush in Atlanta. And it's like, okay, what 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 slows you down at this point? <laughs> Yeah, Atlanta was the one. Like they yeah. were saying, nah, no way. Like this is too fast. Yeah, too fast. Um, tricky layout with a blind hill and blind crest, blind zones. Say, there's like, hills. No yeah. way. <laughs> like this is a driver knowledge track. And I did find it tough. Um, it's not the easiest track, especially in an S chassis. Actually, it's it's not the best track because you hmm. have rear mounted rack. You're coming into that first corner at over 100 miles per hour you throw to nearly 90 degrees and you have to brake as you're on the handbrake and s chassis don't like that so your steering kind of gets stuck it can get bound up quite easily oh, and okay. uh, that's where a lot of the development with wise fab came in the years after just changing things to fix that issue but almost all s chassis with rear mount racks have that issue if you're you're asking too much I did not, I'm not, I, I'm admittedly not like an S chassis person. So I had no idea. And I know there's a bunch of people screaming like, oh, how did you not know that? I'm like, okay. <laughs> I drive weird stuff. Like, but, but yeah, that's, S that's chassis are totally fine uh, on 90% of tracks. They're amazing. But, um, it's, but that's it's that one full lock break full lock issue. breaking hard, trying to go okay. from a hundred to 50 in two seconds. Hmm. Like you're asking a lot, but if that's when you're driving it aggressively, if you're, if you're smooth and just, you know, doing what you need to do, you can avoid the issue totally. But when you're pushing the limits, you find issues quicker. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was a challenge. But as soon as we got into tandem and kind of figured it out, um, it all came together. Next thing, it was an All-Irish final with Dean. And it was very close. And we, we managed to get the win. So that one was kind of... I remember the internet after that where it was like, okay, Maybe he is good. <laughs> we, we've got a problem now. Maybe yeah. he is okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I think was interesting, especially with getting on to tandem, is that like they had to change the rule book for you. And it, it's something that I, 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 I've talked about previously where like there's different eras in Formula Drift and you coming in is, is definitely the start of an era because you, I don't know if you did this purposely or just the way you drove, but it's almost like you looked at the judging style and went, oh, you reward proximity. I'll scrub a little bit of angle out, but I'm going to be basically front bumper to front bumper. And it was the first time that we really saw that. Was that strategic or is that like, no, that's just the way I've, I've been driving and it just happened to be, you know, the way they judge. Yeah, for me personally, close proximity looks way better in my opinion. This yes. is the thing about drifting. There's so many different opinions, but in my no. opinion, <laughs> people get excited if you're putting tire marks on the lead car's door wing yeah. even if it's front wheel to front wheel i know it's not ideal but that in my opinion looks better than you know a car width apart and a matching angle matching everything i think it looks way more aggressive if you're slightly 
you're doing whatever you can to be right there. That's my personal opinion. And I was also used to, uh, <laughs> I was also used to Irish, um, you know, the Irish rule book, which is they have a three meter rule. And if you're three meter, or is it two meter rule? Maybe it's two meter. If you're six feet from the yeah, lead car. Say, we, you, we had to do freedom units for all yeah, the American listeners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you're six feet from the lead car, you can um, come slightly off the qualifying line to maintain proximity. Okay. So the Irish uh, judges really rewarded proximity. Proximity. And uh, yeah, that's what we went there to try to do. Just don't let the cars get away. And it was also in my head before we went there, like, our, our car is going to be fast enough. We only know what mm-hmm. we know. Um, we ran the setup that we ran in Europe for years with my S chassis and Peter's S chassis. We kind of found um, a balance between both of our styles and ran that setup in both cars at every track. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, we were like, okay, these guys are fast. FD is all about speed, crazy power, crazy cars. And to be honest, we were quite surprised that we had the speed right off the bat we might we weren't we were never the fastest um but we were within you know we were close enough to be able to compromise certain things to stay within proximity yeah i i think the the biggest thing i gleaned from from watching you guys over those three years was the way that the car would pivot and it was very different than even some of the other s chassis where they would pivot almost kind of like center of the rack Whereas you guys, that car would rotate what seemed to be next to the driver. Like it was very center of mass and, and the way the car would rotate seemed to allow you guys to get like crazy proximity, spin the car really quick, but catch it. I, I don't know if that's me just overanalyzing the way the cars were built, but like watching between you and Odie in particular, like Odie's car would, would kind of pendulum off the front and then yours looked like somebody put a turntable in the center of the car and it would just move right at the middle. Honestly, I feel like that is just being comfortable in a car. So like yeah. we felt at home in these cars right away and we could just drive them like we dro- drove our previous cars in Europe, like my S14, Peter's S14 mm-hmm. and Skyline. They all felt really similar. And okay. we just, you know, knew what to do, knew how to react within an instant. And I feel like that just made the cars look smooth where... Mm. As I said, they weren't the fastest cars. We weren't doing crazy things with suspension and geometry to, you know, make the car be half a second faster over the course. I feel like being comfortable in a car, you can make that space or time up just by feeling like you know what the car is going to do when you push it to the limit. Hmm. Just that that comfortability of like, okay, I know how this car is going to react. I know how it's yeah. going to handle. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's an S chassis. It's the same parts that everybody else can buy off the shelf and put on their one. It's just mm. a matter of, you know, fine tuning and being comfortable. And I think that we had both of the, those nailed down. Yeah. And I mean, relatively speaking, it was a simple build. And I, I think even going back to your old S chassis, the DRX7 and everything else, like the simplicity seem to be your building ethos where it's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I mean, other than taking the rotary out and putting a SR in, but uh, I mean, I guess that is broken. You are fixing it. So, um, <laughs> but that, that seemed to be the biggest thing. Cause I don't think you guys ever went out on, on like a broken car or anything else. Yeah. And, the in what, in the three seasons I had one engine failure in St. Louis, which was the middle, middle of the second year. And mm-hmm. that was, I think it was on the same engine internals as the first year. So just refreshed in the off season, uh, yeah. bearings, gaskets, bowls, things like that. So it was still the same block, same head. I'm pretty much sure, pretty sure it was the same rods. Um, so Crazy. yeah, like that's just, I think we were never pushing that much nitrous and power before. Um, so we found the first weakest link and it was a rod bowl failed when we we're revving them mm. to almost 9,000 with, 150 shot of nitrous. Um, after that, we learned to, you know, refresh the rods every season. Yeah, and, and you guys seem to run like a kind of a softer limiter as well. That was something else that I was looking at for, for it. It seemed to be you kind of geared the car for the limiter in a lot of cases or would bring the limiter down, gear it for that, bump the yeah. limiter up and chase so you could run a little bit harder. I heard a lot of people talking about that. And honestly, 
we put myself and Peter in Europe before we came to FD. There's this track in Riga. I'm pretty sure you, you yeah. know it. And oh, yeah. it was kind of test between the two of us and maybe one other driver. It was like, who could do the first three corners without lifting off the throttle once? And it, like, there's blind transitions. It's a scary, yeah. daunting track. And Peter was the first one to do it. And I never did a transition before that point while staying totally flat out. Like, no lift for the transition, totally flat out. And um, we kind of, I, I started doing that too. So just like, you know, you can always modulate the throttle and stay within your, you know, between six and 8,000 RPM. Yeah, you can modulate power and kind zone. of stay there and drift the car. But you mm -hmm. can also do it absolutely flat out if you're balanced, comfortable, and on the limit. So um, we kind of started doing that, and it looked more committed because it's not like the cars are geared too short because they're still right. blowing the tires off. It. There's loads of tire smoke, loads of angle, and it just sounds like this person is on a mission. And uh, I, I, I loved watching Peter's style before we were even teammates. And... Uh, I think when we became teammates, we learned things off each other and we were both able to progress even more. So that was just the thing, right? Peter's able to do Irwindale on the bank, on the rev limiter, transition mm -hmm. pretty much full throttle and come in to the inside pretty much full throttle. And I've never seen anyone else do that. I've tried it yeah. once. I I tried it a few times. It, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> but one of the times I tried it, I hit the back wheel off the wall coming into the inner bank. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how did I get away with that? That was way too close. But Peter was just able to do it. And he has this no fear mentality. And uh, yeah, he's, he's an amazing driver for sure. I think I think he did. It was a 2019. He took himself out basically doing that exact same thing. Just a little too hard. I think it was in the chase. And, yeah, uh, a little, little yeah. too hard, but it happens like you're it's, playing with fire. If if that yeah. didn't happen, he would have beat everyone there. And I still think that he's the, the best driver I've ever seen around Irwindale. Um, yeah. Just the most committed. And from the first lap, like it takes that track for me, takes a minute to warm up to because mm. you know that you can, uh, you can throw it all away or you can ruin your weekend with one wrong move. But he just had the confidence from the first lap, clutch kick straight into the bank and, yeah. you know, blow the taillights off the wall. It's just mad. Yeah. Mad. He's, he is, he, I mean, he's an incredible driver. I mean, it's almost, without sounding shitty, like it's almost a shame that he partnered with you because like it did take some of the spotlight away from what he is able to do. And I think if you <laughs> weren't there at the same time, we would have seen him probably on the podium significantly more. It's just, and it's not like you guys battled that often. There's only a couple of occasions over three years, but yeah, it's just... I, I feel yeah. like the first year for him, uh, he was more unlucky than I was with car issues. Mm. Uh, my car ran absolutely flawlessly the first season. And I had FD experience. I had friends in the US. I feel like the transition for me was a bit easier where he was coming from Poland. Uh, nobody knew him. You know, nobody in the US heard of him before. Like everyone mm -hmm. in Europe knew exactly who he was but he was a new name to FD in the US. So it took maybe a little bit longer for him to get to get comfy, but he still ended up winning the last round in Irwindale in his first season. Like yeah. that, that everyone knew who he was at the end of the season because he had some crazy battles with lots of people. Um, so I, I, yeah, I feel bad that 2020 didn't happen for him. Yeah. Um, because... Yeah, like 2019, he was on a mission and he's been on a mission ever since. So I feel like if he, if COVID didn't happen, that could have been Peter's year for sure. I would, I would absolutely love to see him come back. I mean, I believe the, the Vortaus rig is still sitting at a Chicago pier or something like that right now. Every once in a while it pops up on the internet. Someone's like, oh my God, it's still here. He's coming back. And it's like, I, I don't think it's left. <laughs> but, yeah. So friends of, um, <sighs> They're Polish. There's a Polish trucking company. I think it's Casey. I'm not sure what what it is, but okay. they're based in Chicago, and uh, they've been storing the the rig. But mm. I I don't know what their plan is, to be honest. Yeah, I think that would be. I mean, it would be incredible to see him come back. I mean, there's there's so many people. I think we're getting so close to this like 
insane all-star lineup of of drivers now. Um, yeah, I mean, if yeah, if Dago Saito came back, like that'd be insane. Peter comes back. I mean, maybe we'll pull Tanner Faust out of retirement or something. Yeah. Um, I, I would I would like to see like an all-star invitational at some point for FD where it's like, if you've won a championship, you're good to come back and we're going to do like a, a spec car round or something like that. Yeah, I was even talking to Chelsea about this. I, I hung out with Chelsea um, last weekend. Oh, yep. sorry, last week between Florida and Grid Life. And we're just chatting about lots of different things. But I personally feel like there needs to be some form of what Red Bull was years ago in 20, 2008, uh, the mm-hmm. Red Bull World Drift Championship. I feel like that needs to return now where drifting is far bigger than it was then um, and have the best from the US, the best Europeans and, you know, some of the other top drift series in the world come to one event or maybe a a triple crown or something like that. And just, it has to happen because I feel like I'm one of the only drivers, uh, one of the lucky ones that has been able to experience drifting in the US, in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, you know, Mm -hmm. all around the place and drive with so many top level drivers it's just always a shame, a little bit of a shame that the best aren't always there on one given event anywhere because yeah. that, you know, they're just not, there's some, I mean, a, there's some amazing drivers in Europe. Um, and there's amazing drivers in the U S obviously there's Japanese amazing driver. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it, I'd love to see it one day for sure. I I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked that you'd want Red Bull to come back considering what it did to your S 14 at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was I mean, just sixteen. It was uh, one of my. It was my first wall crash, actually. It was quite the wall crash, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was talking Been to Jared about this last week. There's a clip on YouTube of uh, me crashing in one more time battle with Tinku Jan from mm-hmm. Malaysia, and I hit the wall. I came in too hot behind him. I touched the back of his car and blow the top of my radiator off, and. Uh, Jared is saying like, oh, James Ian out there, like Thomas the train. You know, Thomas just, the tank engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah just <laughs> blowing the steam straight out. But uh, uh, yeah, good times and yeah. good memories. That was It was a tough event actually because um, I used to run SR all the time in my S chassis up until that point. And mm-hmm. when we're, we had the opportunity to go to the US, I had um, support from some Irish companies and uh, we decided to last minute put an RB26 in there and ship it off. And basically, that event was figuring out all the teething issues. So it was overheating, Jeez. power steering issues. Yeah, we 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 never uh, we 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 didn't have it right. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, you've learned now where it's like you know, testing at an event is not what you want to do. You want to be testing well before you. Uh, well, before you ever get there. Absolutely. So, um, I, I will admit we've done a lot of digging and it seems like you just were obsessed with motorsports for a long time, but like you almost didn't hit the map until kind of in your teen years, like in public school, it doesn't seem like you were part of any teams. You weren't like on the, the handwriting team or the uh, agricultural clubs or anything like that. It was you really went digging. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. No, we. I mean, I, I even I, I wanted to see if you were part of the orienteering team because turns out that your public school was quite well known for handwriting and orienteering. Yeah, um, it was, yeah. But it looked like you were just somewhere else that whole time, even through high school. Was that just all field drifting, and that was it? Um, so when I was very young, I was into farming. So okay. I live in, live in the countryside. I have um, my next door neighbor is a farmer. Mm. Now his son is actually just after starting drifting. So like we obviously have had an influence on each other. Yeah, <laughs> they've been listening to loud cars in the middle of the night for twenty years. Um, yeah, but yeah, farming was my thing until I was about eight or nine. Um, then I was mad for off roading. So okay. four by fours in the, in the mountains. So my yep. uncle runs the like Monster Four by Four Club, and I was obsessed with that. Is that up uh, in what is it, Ballyhara? If I'm yeah. pronouncing that correctly, Whoa. okay, you're you're very close to home. Yeah. <laughs> um. So there in the Nagel Mountains. Uh, so yep. I, that was my f- favorite thing to do. My dad used to. We had Land Rovers, and we'd just go up 
up the mountains on a Sunday and it was my favorite thing to do for sure. I used to drive the Jeep. You know, I was small one time. Yeah. Uh, so when I could barely reach the pedals. And uh, yeah, that was that was it until um, rallying. My yeah. brothers started rallying and uh, we used to go watch rallies if they weren't competing. And instantly I loved that. So we always used to go to a tight hairpin, watch the cars go sideways. And I used to get super mm. excited with cars going sideways. So then cars kind of um, took a big interest um, to me. Um, then the first Irish drift event was in 2002, December 2002. My brother entered it in his E30 uh, 3 to 5 BMW. And Would that have been at Rose Green? Rose Green. Or Tipperary Raceway? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we went there. Um, he managed to win the event, and I just absolutely fell in love with what I was seeing. Um, so, met some, even though I was only 10 years old. I used to hang out with my older brothers quite a lot. They're 10 and 12 years older than me and uh, used to be listening to their friends and just like generally hanging out with people much older than me. Yeah. Um, so they got a hold of all the option DVDs um, <laughs> from Japan and stuff. And that's all I did was watch that, get obsessed with it, um, started playing Gran Turismo, drifting on that game okay. like crazy and uh, just built a dream that this is what I wanted to do. So school... School wasn't... I did enough in school to get by. Yeah. I it just. Yeah. <laughs> I was always thinking about cars and how am I going to get my next 20 euros to buy a jerry can of fuel to put into my car to drive in the field? You know, maybe in two weeks' time I, I yeah. can afford to go for a spin again. And I was driving in the fields. Um, my brother let me drive his rally car in the mountain when I was extremely young. Just driving whatever I could, driving yard cars and, and farmers' yards, doing donuts, and everything started coming to me really naturally. Um, but I think Gran Turismo had a huge part to play in that because I used to, Gran Turismo 3, I used to do a lap, set a time, like drift a lap, set a time, okay. and then you'd have a ghost car, and yeah. then I would chase the oh. ghost car. You tandem that. So yeah, I was tandeming crazy. and I was linking every track, like the longest straights and big smooth links. Just I perfected drifting on that game before mm. I ever drove on a track. So I when I actually did get to drive, I think my first time driving on track was 14 years old in a Ford Sierra. Um I knew the lines. I knew what to do. I knew how to link one corner to the next, just drag yeah. the handbrake, clutch kicking, like I knew it just all came to me insanely natural and it kind of took off from there. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think the the video game era, I mean, we're seeing it now obviously with like sim racing being huge and, and the availability of that and how good everything's getting. Um, but it's interesting that you kind of figured out the mechanics of it on, on a controller, I'm assuming. On a uh, controller. At the time, yeah. Yeah, so I used to hate, you know, the, the controller, you'd be turning left with your thumb and the wheels would be like that, you know, yeah. like a forklift or something. So I used to roll the controller so the steering would be smooth. So I'd roll oh. up and down so the steering would be smooth left to right. And then you'd watch the replays and it looks like perfectly smooth, normal drifting. Huh. Yeah. What? So a, what a, that's interesting. <laughs> I used to do all sorts of weird stuff like um, the car would have slightly less grip if you clutch kicked it in reverse. To do like if you were doing an insanely long link, I'd be just under rev limiter in reverse to do, hold right. it all the way down the straight and into the next corner. So, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, fun memories. Looking back, I don't have the game. I must actually buy it and uh, get it back and see if I can still play. That'd be a cool. That'd be a cool throwback. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because as so, soon as I had a car for the track, that was it. PlayStation in the bin didn't didn't hmm. matter. Like <laughs> drifting and trying to make money to afford it was all that mattered then. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, uh, working was a full stop auto service. That was kind of the next jump to doing that. They, they came in Dalton tire. It looks like came in. And then was that one of those things where they saw you in the Ford and then you kind of realized, or they, somebody realized like, Oh shit, this, this kid knows what he's doing or how yes. did those first companies so, jump? Like you worked at full stop for a bit. 
Yeah, so it's interesting. I had a few jobs. Um, yeah, you were like a I, Nissan mechanic at a shop for a bit, and then you moved to Volkswagen. So yeah, you've, you've, you've played around with a few different cars. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I was 15 when I was competing uh, with the Ford Sierra, which I bought for 200 euros. I could afford that just. Amazing. Um, but then I was doing really well in it and just getting a max out of the car. And it was like, this thing is just on its limit and we can't we're not going to be able to you know compete with people with srs and s chassis yeah. and things like that so i sold that car um and i had about a thousand euros saved up um i found this s14 for four four grand and i was like okay how do i how can i make this happen so my two brothers helped out with a grand each and a friend of mine his uh He's a crazy guy. Um, he runs a page. Anyone interested in Irish comedy? He runs a page called Even Flow on on Facebook. Check him out or on YouTube. He's hilarious. Okay. Uh, so he he was a stonemason at the time, and he uh, gave me a thousand euros towards my first car too. So I had four grand. We bought it and uh, when competing with that and. I got my pro license. The first event I did was for a pro license and I qualified second out of 60 drivers to get a pro license for Jesus. the Pro Drift mm-hmm. Championship. And did my first competition in that. I didn't qualify um, in the pros. I had a fuel pump issue and mm-hmm. the car was fuel surging and stuff like that. But we got the car running for for actual qualifying, but I, I messed it up because we, yeah, yeah, I just messed it up. Then the second event, we came back, and it was in Rose Green, and I managed to win the event, uh, beating my brother, um, beating Martin Fringe, like top Irish drifters, and somehow ended up being the youngest ever driver to win a pro event. And uh, then I got a few calls from, you know, friends that used to help us out, that we used to buy parts from, and they were like, okay, look, we'll help you get a bit more power. So someone... Um, years motorsport in Ireland supplied a HKS Turbo um, another company supplied an ECU and we started pushing the car forward but then I had 360 horsepower um, tires were getting expensive to, to buy <laughs> um, even though I had support from lo- local tire shop uh, Dalton Tires um, it, dr- drifting was just getting expensive and I'm like okay how am I going to get through this so that was going from 2007 to 2008. And then in 2008, um, Nixon got gave me a call. And basically, they were like, we'd love you to do the Irish Championship and the European Championship. And I'm like, wow, how, how can I do this? That's, they were covering yeah. a lot of the expenses and the tires. And it was a big opportunity. And I was like, how do I make this work? I still you know, I'm still going to be short money, even though they're covering a lot of the expenses because we have to, mm-hmm. you know, repair the car, maintain it, travel, like lots of different things. So I ended up convincing uh, my parents and my family, look, I think I need to, I want to chase the stream mm-hmm. like this. I feel like I can, I have a shot at this. And I, they saw that I was fully committed to it like I was just doing in school just to get by and doing what I needed to like I wasn't doing homework because I was working on cars like things like that but a lot of the teachers understood Mm -hmm. what I was doing and saw what I was doing and they were even supportive Um, so I convinced my parents that look I think I should drop out of school and get a job and just work and drift and make this happen so after a few days of talking to my mo- my mother um she also believed that look if this is really what you want to do and you think you can you can do it and you're going to work hard and chase the dream go for it so my parents fully supported what i was doing i left school got a job with um in a nissan dealership as an apprentice apprentice mechanic um was working there for a year or so then went to volkswagen was working there for about a year and uh, then I went to full stop after that and worked there for a year and then I, I've been full time drifting since then that's crazy yeah so my last normal job was 2012 
<laughs> my last normal job, quote unquote <laughs> normal job. This is not a normal job, trust me. No, no. Yeah. Well, how how long did it take to convince Papa Dean about this? Because like obviously he's got a motorsports heritage, but like it was a traditional rally, a quote unquote traditional rally. Um how hard was that? Like obviously your brothers had a big influence, but yeah, um, so my dad loved rally. Uh, when he first went to drifting to watch my brother compete, he didn't get it. He thought, yeah. he was like, what are these lads at? <laughs> and like drifting was so grassroots back then. It's not like somebody walking into Long Beach and seeing that event. Like it was grassroots. Some people were driving to the track, drifting until their tires were almost gone, then finishing up for the day and driving home on the same set mm-hmm. of tires. Like it was not what it is today. Uh, but then when I started competing, I had my mom and dad coming with me. Dad used to take my car to the track and he started to appreciate the skill that was involved, especially in a very basic car and making it do the things it was doing. And he got really interested in it. And he um, he actually ended up being like the, the tech guy at Pro Drift for, for years. He used to do the tech inspection and things like That's that. Cool. So um, he was doing whatever he could to help support... Uh, me getting to the events and it really helped when, you know, we had a hotel room covered. We he was getting a wage for working at the event and I was there anyway, so it all it all made sense. Uh so when it came to leaving school, he was supportive because he knew the passion that I had. Mm-hmm. Like I would stay in the in the workshop till four or five AM on my own, just doing something small to the car to to either make it look a bit better or to get a bit more performance out of it or whatever. Um, so my family were fully supportive. They definitely believed that I was serious about this and wasn't just trying to get out, out of school. I feel like I'd be amiss if I didn't mention arguably one of the greatest photos I've ever seen in my life, which is your dad and your uncle racing rally. And your dad was a human throttle cable sitting on the strut tower to run the car. And it was like midway through a stage too. It wasn't like, wasn't even like it was near the end. Like he was up there for a bit. Yeah. So they were doing a rally. They were leading their class. And I think it was the final stage. And basically, throttle cable snapped and they don't give up. So dad was like, Jimmy, my uncle, stayed in the driver's seat. Dad jumped out, uh, lifted the hood off, saw that the cable was snapped, just threw the hood over the ditch and jumped up there. And he said, how will I know? My uncle was like, how will I know when to start slowing down? And my dad was like, whenever I lift off, that's your time to break. He said, I'll keep it flat unless we need to stop. <laughs> so they um, they were when they were stopped, um, there was a, another rally car passed them out, whoever mm-hmm. was behind them on the stage. And they got going again and they managed to catch back up with the rally car. But like that famous photo is, there's a couple of photos from that jump. But the four tires are in the air, like it has, yeah. it has air, and it's uh, that shows they weren't just cruising back to the finish line. But <laughs> they managed to get back. I think they were still second or third in their class, um, but they got disqualified because <laughs> my dad wasn't wearing his belt. Basically, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what they pulled him on. But, oh uh, man. Yeah, that that's, just shows like that's something I wouldn't try for sure. So my my dad and my uncle were a lot crazier than than I am anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, that's I mean it whatever it's, it's, it takes. It's wild. It's yeah. just I remember seeing that years and years ago. I think one of the first times you shared it. And I was like, there's no way. And I think every like every couple Father's Days or something like that, or your dad's birthday, you'll share it again. And I'm just reminded, I'm like, this is this is what we do for motorsports at the end of the day. Cause like He's not the only person that would do that, no. um, but uh, he did it. Like that's that's the thing. Yeah, um, <sighs> yeah. So like that just shows. And so many. I've met lots of different people. Um, obviously, over the years, people in rally, like WRC people, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And we'd be chatting away, and that photo would come up in conversation, and they've all seen it. So yeah. like, it's it's cool. It's, it's, it's so iconic. It's very cool. So my dad used to, uh, he was hugely into motorsport and my two uncles, Jimmy and Ray, um, my dad's main business, his business was building rally cars for a living, like from the ground up. Um, 
they used to get brand new shells from from Ford, like Ford Mark II Escort, and yep. build it for rallying. And that was in the the seventies and eighties. And yeah, he was he was flying at that for years uh, until rallying was banned in Ireland for a couple of years due to an accident. So mm-hmm. that's when he got out of rallying. Mm-hmm. So what do you what do you think the reason is that we see so many incredible drivers coming out of Ireland and and like even in particular like a little town stuff somewhere between Limerick and Cork called Mallow like why why there because it's it's you and the Shanahans like you yeah. guys are you guys are like walking distance between each other it, yeah so how did that happen <laughs> so it's myself and the Shanahans, but before that, it was my brother, Darren McNamara, uh, Graham yeah. McNamara, his brother, used to run Pro Drift back in the day. So that's all, like the Shanahans, McNamaras, and some other names that you might have heard of too over the years. Um, we all live within 10 minutes. And I don't know. So, for, <laughs> Damn, for, I was hoping for a good reason here. It's up in the water. <laughs> yeah, they, everyone says the uh, River Blackwater, like whatever, whatever that's pumping out is good stuff. But, yeah. I feel Ireland in general, the Drift Championship itself. So, like we had great, we have a great judge still, uh, Kieran Hines, and he really, mm-hmm. um, really pushed the drivers on line. And basically, if you weren't getting your line um, nailed down, if you were missing clipping points, he would screw you. Like you're just, you're just not doing well. He would rather see almost no angle and get the line right. Because at okay. least the lead driver will always be predictable for the chase driver, so it leads to good battles. Hmm. So if you're, if you're, you know, huge angle, but you're missing clips or mowing stuff over or just being aggressive but all over the place, that is insanely hard to chase comparing to someone not being aggressive but getting the line. So I feel like all drivers in Ireland really focused hard on line, and then if you can, if you're getting the line right, you can then add your impact, your style, your aggression. But mm-hmm. what's what's all that if you're in the wrong place on track? So I feel like um, we just had a great judging system. We had great technical tracks. Um, you had to work to fill all the zones. And uh, yeah. then just, I think, Irish mentality in, in general, where, you know, we're, we're, we're fighters. We, we like to try to um, try to win. Try to you know better your there, your you're battling your best friend you know what I mean there's so there's a like, lot of there's no way you're beating me yeah yeah there's <laughs> there's a lot of that like one upsmanship like you do it this way I'm gonna do it better like I'm gonna do it crazier or better or more or whatever yeah I, I think so so I yeah. was always great friends with probably the person I was battling the hardest on track so like myself okay. and Nigel Colifer for instance were best of friends for for years and I don't know how many finals we were both in together um same with myself and Dean before that and um lots of different people like the Shanahan's now mm-hmm. um you just it's just good fun you know yeah. you win or you lose you're, you're talking about drifting you're talking about what you love um you're winding each other up you're you know it, it's you get the fun side out of it because you know as soon as you're on track of course, it's serious. You want to win. You're you're doing what you can to to do what it takes. But um, as soon as you're off track, you just want to have fun. Yeah, is that is that more or less your mentality? Like, do you are you one of those guys that like when the door closes or when the visor goes down, everything gets blocked out? It's like no, I'm just I'm looking at what I'm about to do. Or because like off track, you're hilarious. I mean, in a couple of times we've hung out together, like you're always cracking jokes. You're making fun of people, like in a in a lighthearted way, obviously. But it's it's it is very much like a switch that I've seen, even in burnout pits and stuff like that, where it's like that door closes and it's just a completely different human being. Yeah. So, like when I was doing FD before, I felt like obviously the first season was like la di da. Oh my god, we just managed to win. Didn't yeah. expect it, but we were obviously trying our best. Um, after that, it was like, whoa, it'd be amazing to to do it again because we we had the confidence. And the third season, it was just like, what's going on again? You know, it was hard to yeah. believe what because the third season was actually really challenging. We had a lot of car issues. It wasn't an easy season. Um, so, of course, it depends. It depends really. But 
I am competitive. I do want to win. Like still mm-hmm. to this day, obviously, I, I'm <laughs> trying my best to to win. But I think my mindset has changed a bit. Um, whereas I feel now, you know, why do we drift? How? Why are we doing this? It's why are people coming to the track to see us? Like it's to see a good show, and that's what I think I'm almost more focused on now. Like mm. I feel like I've become maybe obviously we're driving a new car this year so that's very different um but i feel like i've become more about the show a bit than just outright doing whatever it takes be fully calculated to make no mistakes and win where now i feel like i'm more okay let's try to get as close to that 100 point run as possible even if if i over push it's my own fault it's a shame i pushed too hard but at least i didn't under push so i feel like Mm. go as hard as you can Worst case scenario, you, you lose a bumper, you, you tag the wall, um, you hit someone, you know what I mean? But if it works out, it's going to be sick. So, um, that's hanging out with Chelsea that, too much. Sorry? <laughs> so you've been hanging out with Chelsea too much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but no, I feel like I've been like that over the last couple of years, even in <clears throat> Europe. Um, you know, Europe has kind of turned into grip wars between all mm-hmm. the different tires involved. So I felt like my only, my strongest thing was doing a sick lead run and just throw it in with as much angle as possible fill the whole track like full throttle full lock and just put on a show like that's that's kind of the best thing i could do with the with the speed that we had basically um so yeah it depends it depends but of course i'm focusing on what you need to do but you can never predict the future like there's two of you mm. on track you don't know exactly what the lead car is going to do. One small adjustment on his end could make or break what you're trying to do behind him. So yeah. it's like, you're always trying for perfection, but it doesn't always go that way. How how has the transition been to the Mustangs? Because I'm not, by, by your standards, it's been a, for anybody else, it's been an incredible year. By your standards, it seems to be a bit of a rougher year transitioning into that. And I don't know if that's a chassis thing, if that's a travel thing. Um, we've talked to a lot of other drivers about what it's like to com- like do these commutes and how tough that can be. Um, this chassis is gigantic, um, crazy fast. I think the biggest tires you've run, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So like this is a very different beast than anything you've driven previously. Yeah. So there's a lot to get used to. Um, they've had it right and drive. Like first yeah. Mustang RTR right and drive, which is sick and people love so it. So crazy. Yeah. Um I love the fact that it's it's a crazy V8. It's something I haven't used before. Um, totally different suspension setup, uh, different way of of doing things. And uh it's just a learning curve. So like RTR have a way of making that fast for each track, which makes the car feel different at each track. So okay. whereas when I was competing in my own cars, an S chassis was a much simpler car. Um, we actually ran the exact same setup at every single event. So I knew as soon as I jump into that car, it's the same car as I drove last time. Where now I feel like you probably need to do a full season to be 100% comfortable because you have mm-hmm. your notes on the previous year where now the car feels like a slightly different car at every track. And we're also adjusting things to suit my driving style more because I have a totally different driving style to Adam and Adam, Chelsea and Vaughn. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of things that we're, we're getting used to. But in general, I think we're doing very good. Like, yeah, like fifth right now or something. Like, four, I, I just four, mean, we're sitting fourth, fourth okay. right now, right? And that <laughs> is better than I was. I think I was like 10th in 2019 at the start of the season because yeah. things were not going to plan. Um, so I feel more comfortable every single event we do. And I'm also very proud that we've had in Long Beach a really close battle with Frederick. We got yeah. knocked out there. In Atlanta, a really close battle with Chris. We got knocked out there. And in um, in Orlando, a really close battle with Chelsea. So I don't yeah. feel like we're getting absolutely hammered by everyone. But yeah. I, I feel like we're learning and we're getting there and we're we're slowly starting to turn up the heat. 
I think it's just one of those that the the expectation coming into this season was so high for you, where it's like, James Dean's the guy that just comes in and dominates everything immediately, no questions asked. Which, like, if you look at your history, is not necessarily the case. But for FD fans, that is what they assume. So I think when you immediately didn't just start winning events, people were like, oh, Who's what's he? going on here? <laughs> Party? Yeah, yeah, it's, well... What, and ha- I what mean, happened to him? Yeah, yeah, is he getting old? Is he tired? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Yeah. It's getting leg cramps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just jet lag. No. Just jet lag. <laughs> uh, honestly, I'm I'm very happy with how we're doing. Um, yeah. The level has come on too. Like, you have to admit that it's after jumping. People are after figuring out, you know, how to be aggressive, how to do mm. strong lead runs. It's it's not like a handful anymore. It's like you got 16 to 20 people that are pushing the limits. Well- Stuki going at one more time with you. I mean, if yeah. if you asked, like, and there's nothing against Stuki, he was on the show before, but like, if you were to ask the entire FD audience, how many people be like, oh yeah, yeah, Daniel Stuki's going to go one more time with James Dean, like that that right there, a guy who's only been in pro for I think this is his second season, like that that shows you where the level of competition is now. Exactly, and these people are hungry. They're you know new people into the sport. It's all fresh for them. They're driving against people that you know I, I remember it when I was battling Chris or Vaughn or any of those guys when I came in it's like that's when you turn it off to 11 and you yeah. do things that you don't even know you could do because you trust that the big name or whoever it is is going to be in all the right places and this is your time to shine so I've I've noticed that over the last um, five or six years that even somebody that people don't expect is going to do well today can do a final battle level chase against you because they're mm-hmm. just going to throw everything and more at you to try to win. And uh, that's something that's brilliant because it leads to amazing battles for people to see. Like, I don't know how many times like my my spotter and uh, uh, one of my best friends, Michael, um, who works with me full time, um, his, you know, we've done events in the Middle East and you're battling a guy in top 16. It's your first battle of the season. You're expecting, oh, this will be fine. And the mm-hmm. next thing, he's painting your doors around the whole track. And you're you're like, how hard do I have to push here, Michael? And he's like, 100%. I'm like, what? It's only top 16. So <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's great to see. But um, yeah, you have to be ready for everyone for sure. Hey, everybody. Jacob here from the Formula Drift podcast. We have an awesome deal for you. So if you head over to shopfd.com and use coupon code podcast23, you're going to save 20% on any merch. So anything you can find on that website, use podcast23 at shopfd.com. Save yourself 20%. Hats, shirts, lanyards, whatever. Just use the code. Save yourself some money. So why not? You know, don't, don't stop listening. Wait till the show's done. But then head over, shopfd.com. Use podcast twenty three. We'll see you guys out there. Who who do you think is the best driver right now? Out that's not competing in Formula Drift. That like you know maybe you like if you if you had the ability to bring them over, it'd be like oh this guy's gonna ruin everybody. I feel like Peter is really ready. Um, I feel like he probably has more seat time than anyone as well because yeah. they take they they take it full on serious. Um, they test before every Drift Masters event. So he's fresh with tandem, he's fresh, the car is right, um, they have it dialed, and he is just, I, I feel like he's the strongest right now. Like, his chase driving is just ridiculous, and yeah, he's got the car, software. he's got the tire, his, I know the tire is, is obviously an issue with FD, but um, him on the right tire in FD would be very hard to beat. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I yeah. Behind that, do. um, I would say the Shanahan's, either Jack or Connor, they're amazing as well. Um, yeah. But I still feel like Peter has the edge because of just the outright setup. Yeah, and, and I mean, and frankly experience. speaking, he, he's he's also got the budget to be able to do that. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, like not mixing words, that, that has so much to play in how good you can get. Like if you can have almost unlimited seat time, that's going to develop your driving and that's nothing to take away from his natural ability. But like, if you have that ability to, to drive whenever you want, that just means practice is any time. Yeah, no, it massively helps. But the one yeah. thing about drifting is no matter how much practice and stuff you do, it's where's your mind in the moment. 
Because right. if your mind is slightly taken away with something else, you're in trouble. Um, so sometimes it doesn't matter how much seat time you have. If you're feeling good on the day, like look at Vaughn in Atlanta. He's been out yeah. of the seat for a season and he <laughs> came, a perfect event. I was, I was standing back and watching Vaughn that weekend. And I was like, what is going on? This man has so <laughs> much energy. He was so positive. And like he said that morning, I'm just going to win today. That's it. Like he Crazy. was ready for any challenge. And, uh, that just shows mindset. He had the energy, he had the focus and he had the, the car. So, um, if any of those things are off, I think you're in trouble no matter how good you are. It's a good point. I, I, do you do anything specifically to kind of clear your head before a battle? Like sing something? I don't know. Not really. I'm no. one of those guys that I don't really do uh, anything. I just like <laughs> show up, try to make sure I've, you know, been for a pee, make sure I've, um, you know, I've drank water. I've had, I've had, had a food. banana. Yeah, had, yeah. Had a banana. Like yeah. small things. Just make sure I'm just, there's nothing silly going on. Like, as simple as a toilet. Like, there's nothing worse than yeah. being an FD and someone crashes, you're the next battle, then you're waiting for 40 minutes in your car strapped in, in the heat, and you're like, God, that pee I thought I could definitely hold on to is now just, that's all I can focus on. And you're about to uh. battle Asbo or something. You know, it's like, it's the small <laughs> things, um, the small things for sure. So that's that's the way I feel. Yeah, I mean, we. I think we got to talk to FD because they took that that toilet out at the top of the hill in Atlanta, and I heard so many guys complaining about it. like I have to walk all the way back here. Like this was my ritual. I would get out right here, go to the bathroom, get back in my car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Small bathroom things, ritual. But, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I don't do anything like before. I should do more probably. Um, I mean, if it's working for you, I would probably stick with what you're not doing in this case. Yeah, but you know. What I definitely do is before an FD event, just watch the previous season, okay. see the battles, see what people were doing, see how people were messing up, and just so you have it fresh in your mind. Um, obviously, I'd like to do more on the sim, so I did. I did quite a bit on the sim, like a couple of nights before I went to Long Beach, and it just helps with your timing and things like that. Um, so I feel like people that do use the sim, it is beneficial but i i find it more difficult because i um i've i've figured out drifting before good sims were available yeah so controller. anytime <laughs> i drive the sim i'm kind of a bit bored mm. because you don't have the you don't have the sensations you don't have the g-forces you don't have the raw power you don't have the danger elements you don't have all the risk you know so it, it kind of gets a bit a bit repetitive and boring Whereas real life is like full on, like I am not bored of drifting. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I've i never, and I, by no means am I even a decent drifter, to be honest with you. Uh, I've never been able to drift on a sim. I just, I think my body is so used to having that that motion and that's when I need to do things. And I just haven't been able to put it solely in my head, I guess. Yeah, I feel like perception of speed is the biggest issue with everyone mm -hmm. uh, when you start yeah. playing the sim because you feel like you're doing... 30 but you're doing 130 you know it's like you can't judge the speed so you just come into everything way too fast so once you get that element in your mind right it uh it starts coming together a lot easier hmm. i'll get one of those rumble packs or something i don't know yeah. yeah i've got i've got no time to do it anyways but i mean i guess if i did i should that's that's the other side of it like i would yeah. probably play it more if i was sitting at home for I don't know. Even if I was at home for five days a month, I'd probably manage to turn it on. Is that is that where you're at now? Like, have you mapped out your whole year and just kind of went, "Cool, I get four days to myself." Yeah. So, what have I done recently? I went. I've went from. I went from Ireland to Memphis, Memphis to Mandelo, uh, Mandelo to. Atlanta, Atlanta to Ireland to England to the Nurburgring, back to um, Orlando, and I think that's it. I might be missing something, but I have this weekend off. Uh, Drift Masters is on this weekend, so I'll be just checking that out. And yeah. uh, the Irish Drift Championship is on too, so I might just go and support that on Sunday. Just just hang out. Nice. My nephew is competing in that. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, it's uh, this weekend is off. Next weekend I've Gatville in Sweden. Weekend after FD New Jersey. Then I have a weekend off, and then three again. So it's it's busy. Yeah, it's busy. But I, I I've just come off seven in a row. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, grid life's kind of a kind of a break, but not really. I grid mean, life was great. Like yeah, it was. Did you, did you enjoy? You enjoyed it? Oh, hundred percent. Really yeah. enjoyed it. For me, it was just nice to hang out with the team and not be under uh, competition pressure. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Just hanging out. Um, Vaughn was there on the Saturday and we just all had a great time and uh, driving the left and drive demo car was fun too because it's absolutely totally different to the pro car so yeah. different motor different steering different um, trends like left and drive different suspension like mm-hmm. totally different so that was uh, that was fun too and uh, yeah it was just a good way to end um, a few busy weeks what what are you doing? So with that much travel, I like is there? I'm assuming you have to book like business class because you're a hundred feet tall. No. Um, you're just in regular economy, just yeah, eating so off I your Yeah, I try to get an emergency exit. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, like I this will tell you how stupid I am. Um, so with all my years doing FD, I never signed up for miles. So this is my first year signing up for miles. I don't know why oh, I did. I don't know oh, why. Because, yeah, the team used to book the flights and it was just like, oh, it was just so busy. It wasn't a priority. I was like, right, yeah. next flight, next flight, next flight. And then I stopped and I was like, why didn't I save all those miles? <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I use, um, yeah, just an emergency exit. And it's honestly yeah. fine. I can stretch my legs out. Just is, when you is fall asleep, you, do- you just have to remember, try not to trip people. <laughs> Is there is there anything you do travel wise to like keep like keep the insanity down? Like that that's something I've personally been struggling with this year. It's the most travel I've ever done, and I'm like, I've had people tell me like, oh, put your clothes away when you get to the hotel, or like you know, bring something to do that you can always do, like Game Boy or something like that. That's that was throwing me back some age, but when I'm actually on the flights, if I'm awake, if I'm not just exhausted, I watch maybe something on Netflix or catch up on notes on the phone just with work stuff back home, mm. um, edit a YouTube video, things like that. But if I'm exhausted, I will um, I literally just sit there with my eyes closed, maybe play some music, maybe not even just try to close my eyes and have the time to just zone out. Mm. Um, so it, it depends. But there's no, I don't have a routine like, okay, when I get to the hotel, I do this. I fold all my socks. I put my t-shirts. In. No, I don't. Everything is a just mess. My suitcase explodes, and yeah, <laughs> we're we're good to go. Separate the dirty stuff from the clean stuff and drive on. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> I it's it's so funny because it's you're normal so, to me. No, it's like it's, I know it's normal. It's not like it, it's what I think is fascinating is how counterintuitive you as a human being are to what most people would consider success, and I don't like. What, let me unpack that for a second. Like you hear all these people are like, oh, you've got to get into a routine. You've got to do these things. You've got to get your head right. You've got to, you know, and you are arguably the greatest drifter of all time at this point. I mean, whether you're willing to accept that or not. And <laughs> you're like, I don't have any routines. I don't do anything particularly interesting outside of this. There's nothing that I'm doing to get my head space right. I just go and drive. Like I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, but obviously it's working. Yeah, like, of course, there's things you could do. Like, there's, there's probably things I should do way more, but it's kind of like, yeah, I remember going to FD uh, in 2017, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, so if I, I remember saying to my friends, if I ever go to FD, I'm, if I ever get the opportunity, I'm joining the gym, I'm going to get super fit, I'm going to clean up my diet, I'm not going to you know, have a drink with my friends on an off weekend. I'm just going to totally change my life. And yeah. it came and we won Long Beach and it was like, that all happened without changing anything. <clears throat> so it was very hard to then change, if you know what I mean. Um, so I feel like I probably should do more, but I've been able to to make it work. And once I have a weekend off, I, I feel fine again. Like, you know, if you do have seven, eight, nine events in a row, it does get a bit much. But once you have a weekend off to 
see your family and friends and just relax. It's it's all good. And leading up to an FD event, like the weekend before, I'll take easy. I'm not, not you know, out doing anything I shouldn't be doing. I, I'm just yeah, taking it easy, trying to rest and get ready to yeah. travel and, and do well. well one of the, the funniest stories I tell people, I think it was 2018. Uh, I was in Irwindale with a Pro 2 team at the time. And we went to, it was the night before the pro competition. We went to like Walmart to grab stuff. And it was you and Peter eating in a McDonald's inside of a Walmart. And I'm like, what is going, what, what is going on right now? Like, this makes no sense whatsoever. Oh, uh, stuff. Um, yeah. Like, <laughs> like what I was do you just even so say? shocked. Uh, I, mean, I was just shocked. I'm like, I don't get it. What, like, shouldn't he be like, prepping or like going over game plans or taking notes or something like no he's just eating a big mac and hanging out yeah 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 i'm lucky i'm tall i think because if i wasn't i might have some serious uh serious issues but no i i like i feel like i'm active anyway you're active on the, on the yeah. go you're always running around you're you know you're walking a lot you're you're moving around constantly so you are always doing something and sitting in those cars on a race weekend it's hot, you know what I mean. Your your heart yeah. rate is going. You're 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 just on the move. So it's not like we're just all lazy, I know, I know. you know, like doing absolutely nothing. And if I'm at home in the workshop, I'm I'm working hard there. Uh, before FD, I was like, I was doing a, a walk in the mountains every morning. Um, okay. But as soon as we started traveling, it's just hard to keep up the routine because there's yeah. uh, you're, you know stuff starts building up, emails are building up. You got videos to do. You got this. You got that. Like it's it's busy, so it's hard to hard to do everything. There's yeah, time for it, but you ha you have to try to take some time for yourself too. And I yeah. honestly like in my downtime, I like just chilling out, just just relaxing. Like even if I'm by myself, I'm just taking a moment to relax, have watch a couple of YouTube videos, just chill out. One of my favorite things to do at the moment is, um, so I bought a house last year in Ireland and I love coming home to cut the grass. Really? Yeah. Huh. So just jumping right on, cut the grass. No music even. I will happily just cut the grass. <laughs> and that's my way of switching off. Is um, that, is it that in Mallow as well? Like in that same area or are you? Yeah. Like yeah. A so closer? I bought a house like five, six minutes from my home place. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So okay. it's. Uh, I, was, hmm? I wasn't sure if you were going to move to the the true capital of Ireland, Cork, um, or go for the city life. No, I'm not a city person. Okay, like I can <laughs> I can enjoy a city for a few nights, no problem. But there's no place like being out in the country, having space. You know, I, I bought a place which has quite a bit of space, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just. Set it up, set everything up there, build a workshop, and uh, cut my grass. <laughs> cut my grass. <laughs> I told so, you I was a mini farmer at heart. So yeah, I just going back to your roots. Just, yeah. just <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I mentioned it before, but I mean, arguably, you are the, are the best drifter right now, or or uh, that we've seen on record. Have you? taken any introspective time to like look at that do you i don't think you're a person that dwells but like have you had those moments where you're like holy shit like this this is what i'm doing this is who i am is that has that hit you at all or honestly right before um covid i so i was after winning um 2019 fd and mm -hmm. then i went to the middle east to Oh man, and I won that championship. Yeah. And I was after winning nine championships in a row in three years. And I was like, <laughs> that's, Oh, that's when it hit you. Okay. No, I, I stopped and I was at the airport and Becky was with me. And I was like, I said, I, I don't know what to do. Like, hmm. I, do I feel ready for FD to go back there next month? I was like, I don't know. Like, I actually felt like I potentially needed a little bit of time off. Um, just to to see what I wanted to do because 
you were starting like in 19 you were starting to get the other side of it where I was be- I was after becoming the favourite so you see the fans are like supporting the underdog and that's just natural in sport and I was right. like oh I'm just trying my best you know even if you if you win a battle that's like controversial which we all go through we win some like that we lose some like that that's just the, the sport we're in you have to kind of take it um, but sometimes people get really personal towards the drivers when they're just they're just driving a car trying their best even if they yeah. make a mistake they didn't plan to make that mistake that mistake just happened because they were blinded in the smoke having a car issue they were pushing too hard something something happened so I feel like um, just nine championships of those kind of things was was like Jesus what what what, what are we going to do next like how do I reset how do I do I want to come back to try to win FD again? Like, what do I yeah. want to change? Do I want to just drive like an absolute madman and, you know, not always have it work out? I, I just didn't know what to do. And then COVID kind of uh, wrote the, the story from then. Yeah. So it's, 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 uh, it's it depends. It's, um, yeah, it, it depends. It's, it's got to be kind of a lost feeling right like and and it's such an obscure i would assume is an obscure thing to do i mean we i talked to frederick about it as well and like asked him like what what's it like at that point and it, and it's kind of that similar sentiment where it's like where where do i go from here what's left right yeah yeah so i i feel like what happened um at the time was really hard obviously splitting up at worth house and stuff um that wasn't planned like we were going to fd um, in 2020, uh, mm. cars were being prepped. Everything was was going ahead, and then the plans changed. Obviously, we got to call. Um, Peter wasn't sure what his next plan was going to be, seeing as they couldn't uh, travel to the US, and the, we just we ran different teams in Europe anyway, so we mm. couldn't uh, couldn't continue. Basically, yeah. So it kind of gave me. 2020 to see what was up and then 2021 before anything happened uh, with Russia um, we had the opportunity to drive over there in RDS and that was a a great experience it was new tracks new drivers we built a new car built an S chassis myself and Michael and my my family and we built it in 10 weeks from scratch uh, working day and night and shipped it off to over to RDS competed at that and that was uh, a great experience cool tracks um new challenge and uh really enjoyed that so that gave me that opportunity to try something new and then last year we competed in drift masters and um then this year this opportunity with rtr came up and that's been amazing because it it resets everything like it's a new car it's a new team it's new everything and we're back in fd so i feel like Everything kind of happens for a reason, and uh, I wouldn't change anything. I I I feel like I can't go through this podcast without asking about you know the situation with Vorthaus and obviously the documentary that came out. Which I mean, I think anybody watching that, the from my take is from from somebody who made videos for years. You create something that has to be entertaining, and and I don't want to take anything away from the situation because obviously I don't know it, but. I felt like it was very selective, and that maybe that's my opinion on some of the takes. Um, I, ge- I, I guess my question is like, what was your involvement with that, or what was your take on the situation? Is there anything you want to like clear up with that whole thing? Yeah, so the documentary it was something that was was being planned for a while, and um, it was brought to me like, oh, you know, we're going to make a cool documentary on your story so far, and. I was like, oh, it sounds sick. And yeah. I was hoping that it would be something like, how do we get from, you know, playing Gran Turismo to Formula Drift, top level of Formula Drift. Right. And uh, the first take I've seen, I've watched, I was like, right, this is just focused on the last season of FD and zooming into all the struggles we had and getting a lot of people's opinions a lot of other people's opinions of why was everything going wrong. Right. So uh, 
it wasn't ideal. Um, we then cleared quite a bit of that up. Um, and basically the final version of that documentary came out like a few weeks later than it was planned with the partners that were involved with it and stuff like that. So it kind mm -hmm. of had to go live. And yeah, it wasn't exactly the story that I personally wanted to tell. Um, it was getting some of my story and trying to get some, I guess, some other people saying what they believe to be true. And like, right. nobody, who knows the truth, but all I know is that um, in 2019, we did have car issues, a lot of car issues for the first five rounds and changed a lot of different parts to, to try to fix it. And we finally got to the issue um, at the fifth round and it was a software issue um, through the electronics, basically. And it was cutting the car out completely dead randomly and might do five mm -hmm. laps perfect. And then when you want, the car turns up. When you don't want, the car randomly turns up. Um, so it was a hard one to find. And when we did figure it out, the car ran sweet. So it was mm -hmm. kind of one of those ones. And um, the team went through new management as well um, in the same season. And there was just a, a few issues. Um, but overall the important thing is myself and peter and our relationship like that is a pure friendship and still is the same to this day and since then the management has changed again and everything is really open clear and honest and uh myself and peter are in contact all the time great friends fully respect each other 100 percent, and uh yeah it, it was uh a crazy journey we had together for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously I'm super happy to see whatever that situation was didn't affect, you know, the relationship between you two. Because I mean, even... Oh, that, that wasn't... Was, yeah. That was really hard. Like, you know, when Peter called me with the news, I was like, jeez, like it it shocked me. Yeah. Like I, re I remember going into my family and Becky, like we're, we're at home that night and I was like, it's over. And I was like, I couldn't, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was sad, you know what I mean? Like it was, uh, it was, um, not the news that I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. Um, like I planned that we would just ride out 2020 and try to get back to FD in 21 with worth those, but it just gave us both the opportunity to do our own things and, uh, you know, chase new, new dreams basically. Um, everything happens for a reason and now we're sitting here um on this podcast we're driving a brand new ford mustang you know ford on my racing suit that's absolutely sick like that's cool it's coming from a rally background with my dad building fords back in his day and it's just full circle driving for probably the biggest drift team on the planet like it's it's awesome and uh i wouldn't change any of it yeah, it's it's pretty incredible to see going back, you know, first drift car to now and and you know that Ford lineage coming back around. Yeah. I still want to try rally as well at some point. So like yeah. time for a Ford Mark II Escort. My brother has one. Um, oh really? Yeah, my brother if I probably wasn't doing F D this year, I probably would have bought a rally car. But I'm like, I don't have time. I I, yeah. I don't have time. So maybe in the next couple of years. That, I mean, it's that that literally was like the next question is like, okay, what I guess what is next? And it it sounds like rally potentially might be it. Just for fun, not not professionally. Yeah. Like I would just do it for fun. And, I don't know how long that would last. Uh, I don't know. I would love to just <laughs> do like Irish rally stages and put on a show for you know those kids that were once me standing on a tight corner and just come in with the thing back of it locked up. 100 yeah. meters before the corner and just just put on a show spray because that's what's remembered you know what i mean like yeah you don't remember you don't remember the car that's neat and tidy and goes around the car with no drama around the corner with no drama you remember what looked like it was on the edge and was entertaining to watch so um yeah i just like to do something like that yeah i think that i mean obviously that would be the, the ultimate full circle like to be able to come back around and race you know, a, a, yeah. a Cosworth or something like that. And in rally in Ireland, like that would be, 
It'd be insane. I am really lucky too. So two of my best friends from school work with me full time. Um, okay. with my team in, in Europe. So Michael and Mikey. Um, and Mikey actually navigates. He rallies himself and he navigates. So I have a navigator on tap. Um, we're just missing the car. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it would be brilliant. Is that, uh, are they back from the, was it the Nagel Rice days? Uh, yeah, we went to school there in Nagel Rice. So, and I went to school at Michael since I was what, five years old, four years okay. old even. He was a year older than me. So it's a long time knowing each other. And um, yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant yeah. to have two people by your side that you can trust 100%. I could be gone for five weeks at a time and I know that they got everything under control back home. Yeah, that's, I mean, that that mindset alone of, of having that trust and having that, I mean, we, we talk about it in drifting and driving where it's like knowing that your car is is set. Um, I don't want to give it away. I was speaking to a driver recently who uh, talked about that, that they changed the way that the car inspection kind of goes at the line and it literally ends with like a fist bump and they know the moment they get that fist bump that like everything's perfect and I can just go. And I yeah. think having somebody doing things that's maybe not the actual race car, but like the infrastructure of the program and and what happens after the track goes cold is arguably more important. So you're not having to think about that in the car and you can just, you know, whatever it is that you actually do in the car. Yeah, no, like, it, it definitely helps a lot. And that's... That's something that we're learning with RTR as well. Like the team is amazing, but it's it's all new people. So we're building the relationships at the track and at the events. And uh, I feel like we're all really clicking together super quick. So like RTR had to bring on a third car for mm -hmm. the first time ever. So that involves new crew members with a new driver and a new car, like new items on the car because it's right and drive and trying to get it all to all to work. Um, with NFD events, it's I think everyone's doing a, an amazing job. So and yeah. we're we're building a relationship extremely quickly, and they're all super cool, super fun, very welcoming, um, and having a good team around you makes everything just so much better. It's just something else to not worry about, right? If you're not worried about drama or or bullshit, it's like okay, cool. I'm just here to drive. I don't have to worry about pissing somebody off or there being problems, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just a great, great energy. Like everybody is positive. Everyone is trying their best. And once you're trying your best, even if mistakes do happen, you can't say anything if, you know, nothing's intentional. So we're, mm. once you're all trying your best and doing your best on track and, and prepping before it, that's all you can ask for. Yeah. So you're, um, your racing number, did you actually pull that from like James Dean, like the actor James Dean? Yeah, so um, it, I think it was, yeah, a friend was telling me about it, um, about 130 and Little yeah. Bastard, James Dean, all that kind of say, stuff. I was like, have uh, you ever called your car Little Bastard? Yeah, I had it on uh, the RX-7 back in <laughs> oh, 2009. No <laughs> so I was like, am I tempting fade? What am I doing? But I was, yeah, I was just uh, thinking no racing like, in the rain. <laughs> he was, he was the unlucky James Dean, and uh, I was hoping that I could be the lucky one. So just ripped. I liked the number, liked the the story, and uh, yeah, just yeah, use that. I like, mean, you, you you look a little different. So I mean, I, I can see the separation. It does. I will say, it does make research that much harder when your name is tied to somebody who's like incredibly famous as well <laughs> yeah 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 no it definitely looked different that's for sure yeah um, <laughs> but yeah no i thought it was it was it's, it was a funny story when i was a kid and yeah uh, i just liked the number and just tried to make it my own just just lean into it you might as well yeah um so how much the, the first time you came over to the u.s like how much of a culture shock was that? Like I, somebody, so I, I live in Canada uh, and like we're obviously very close to the US, but I remember my early days going over being like, oh, it is very much the same, but incredibly different as well. Yeah. So I, th I think, I think for me, the first time I went there was 2008 and it was a shock. Mm -hmm. Like everything was bigger. Uh, loads of traffic, uh, big city, LA, like 
it was so different. And even as a bunch of Irish that came over, so my, my parents came, uh, my two brothers, and uh, a good few Irish friends as well. Um, it was so different to all of us because even language barrier, even though we speak, we all speak English, like yeah. Irish English is quite a bit different. So a lot of people struggle to understand us and things like that. So I feel like over the years, I've learned how to talk with uh, people from the US. Like if I'm talking to one of my friends sitting next to me, you mightn't understand what I'm saying because mm. we're just twice as fast talking and yeah. our accent comes out a lot more. So I, I've slowed it down a lot so people can kind of understand. And um, yeah, it was it was so different. Like the food, uh, the weather was amazing. Um <laughs> the first, yeah, no. Right. The first time I was there, there was the forest fires as well in LA for that Red okay. Bull World Drift Championship. And we we're like, why is there ashes just landing everywhere? Like mm. it was, it was mad. So it was cool though because I I dreamed I had the US dream at that point. I, I was watching FD, um, all the videos, all the drivers. So when I came and I saw Reese Millen, Sam Huvenet, Tanner Faust, Vaughn, like this was like, wow, we're at the same event as these lads and the smell of real race fuel and crazy V8s. Like we all still had pretty basic cars and yeah. big rigs. Like this was the dream. And I, I got invited because I won the, the 2008 Pro Drift European Championship that year. And that was my invite over and FD helped with, with shipping costs and things like that. So it was, um, yeah, it was just a dream come true. And as soon as I did that event, it wasn't that successful. But I knew after that, that, right, America is the place to be. Like, mm -hmm. how do I make this happen in the future? But I, I tried chasing going back to FD. So obviously I came back for 2010 with Falcon. I uh, did yep. the four rounds there. Had a couple of top eights. One more time with Chris in Sonoma. And some great results with a SR S15. And 2011, we planned to come back with Falcon, but some I think they were planning to build die a new car. And the plan was that I might have the opportunity if they could make it work to drive his uh, PS. So that was a plan, uh, a, a light plan to come back in 2011. It didn't happen. Die, die stayed in the, the PS for another year. And um, I just kept on keeping an eye on FD. I had some options to come back with different teams and I was like, I don't think I really want to go back unless the unless it's a really good team with a really good yeah. car. Like I didn't want to come back and like I've seen people go to FD and struggle because they just tried to go too soon. They weren't ready, the car wasn't ready, the team wasn't ready, whatever the case may be. So I was like, right, let's let's see what happens. And then I was uh at an after party of one of the Drift Masters events with Peter one one evening in Poland and we we're just having a chat and I'm like, so what what's your dream moving forward? Like what would you want to do? This was in twenty sixteen, like Okay. Maybe September time, like late twenty sixteen. It might have been oh, earlier. Okay. I'm not sure. But it was some point during the season. And he said, Oh, my dream is to um go to FD and I might be actually doing it uh, maybe as soon as next year. And I was like, oh man, that's sick. Like, congratulations. Like, that's <clears throat> that's huge. I said, you'll do amazing over there. Um, let me know if I can help with anything. You know, just yeah. chatting away. And then he said, yeah, but my dream is to, um, if you were my teammate and we both went and shipped two, car two cars over there. And I'm like, What? <laughs> Let's take a turn. <laughs> well, so before I know it, about two weeks later, we're having a meeting with his dad and talking about all the plans. Um, they had built a 370Z V8 uh, Mass Motorsports uh, 370Z for Peter. Um, and he was like, come out, test the car, see what you think. So I went uh, with Peter. Um, he had his S14 there, his practice car, and the three, 370 I drove the Z and I'm like, man, I think that this is a mistake. I said, mm. if if we're going, I think that we should go with cars that we're used to because we're already going to be um, 
trying to figure out so many new things like tracks, different cars, everything else, different competitors. Mm. And they were kind of against the idea at the start, but I was like, it's going to be tough. We should go with what we know, not go with a new engine, a new chassis, a new everything. Um, so they decided it was a good idea and um, we started building two new S15s, one in Ireland, um, which I built with my brothers and uh, we built the exact sister car. They built the exact sister car in Poland. So every single day for two months, I was in contact with uh, the crew chief in Poland, sending pictures back and forth so we could have the two cars exactly the same. And when they came out, finished, they met for the first time in Poland for a test and they were identical. Like it was That's really crazy. cool. Wasn't there a third one for a bit too? That like, it could be a spare? Yeah, there's a spare car, which Peter is using now. Um, so yeah, there's a few S15s. <laughs> so I have the original 17, 18 one. They, um, they shipped it back to me after the 18 season when they were finished with it. Uh, they, yeah. they built a new chassis for me for 19. So I have that chassis in my uh, workshop and it's just like, Damn. It's just the car that was like I love it. Yeah, that's, I, I'll never, never change it. Never, it'll always stay in the Worthos livery, and it's just uh, like just you look at it. I could look at that car by myself and just have amazing memories and moments return back. Yeah, that I mean that arguably when Formula Drift opens a museum, I think that may be where that ends up living at some point <laughs> if you yeah. if you're willing to let it go. Yeah, but. I think yeah, I I need to be dead and buried <laughs> before I let that go. <laughs> yeah, I I have a uh, I have the sentimental value cars have to me is unbelievable. Yeah. It mm. could be even weird. Like I <laughs> <laughs> I um yeah, I still have I have every car bar my first Sierra and my first S14. As in my very first one, pre Falcon yeah. S14. So I have the RX7, I have the first S14, the second S14, the Wertos 15, the Eurofighter. Um, like, yeah, I just, they, they all mean a lot to me. Like, yeah. I, I built the S14.9, so the RDS car, which is in the current Falcon livery with the mm -hmm. 15 front and rear. I built that with potentially the intention of, you know, selling it after a couple of years. But now I just I like it too much, and like Michael, my guys, my guys in the workshop, they were saying, "You better not fall in love with this now. Like this car, you know, just don't fall in love with it." And like we yeah. did a few events, had some moments in it, and I'm like, ah, I'd find it hard to sell it because it's really, it's really. I know it's just an S chassis, but it's really, I feel like the perfect one. Like it's. Mm. It's refined, it's tidy, it's clean, it's reliable, it has all the right parts. We spent insane hours, blood, sweat and tears, just building the car in, in 10 weeks. And um, yeah, just, they, all, they all have a story to tell. I can't, I can't wait to have to have that conversation with Vaughn where you're like, hey, I know the season's <laughs> yeah. over, but I'm going to have to ship this back to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vaughn, um, please do me a special deal. <laughs> I'll talk to him. I'll, it's I'll right see and drive. Like what? What use is it? To, yeah, yeah, exactly. That'll be my argument. Come on, Vaughn, yeah. man. It's right and drive. What are you going to do? You crash it into something. <laughs> uh, let me let me know when you need me to to step in there. I'll I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's it's cool. I love cars, as you can probably tell. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, doing doing the research on this, going through all the vehicles you've driven. I mean. For me, it's it was it was super cool to kind of like look at the heritage between them, what's been done with them. Uh, I have a weird, not weird because it's an incredible car, but like for me, the Eurofighter. Uh, maybe it's because of that the the one video that came out, or maybe like the testing at um, what is it, Watergrass, Watergrass Hill, Watergrass Hill. Like, yep. That was one of those, one of those for me when I saw that video. I'm like, holy shit, this guy can drive anything. Like now we're in a BMW, which is so different than an S chassis and. Like it might be a 2J, but like there were so many differences with that car. And I'm like, I don't know if there's anything he doesn't look comfortable in. <laughs> like, yeah. So the Eurofighter was interesting because it reminds me a lot of the, the Mustang. Mm -hmm. um, we first built it and it didn't suit my driving style quite right. 
Um, it was actually, to be honest, it was probably almost harder than the Mustang in a way at the start. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it took us a year to figure it out. Um, after the first season, we moved some weight around, moved things around, um, just tried to figure out why it felt the way it felt. And it just wasn't snappy enough for my driving style. It felt too kind of heavy at the back and it didn't mm. rotate and snap like I'd like a car to. Um, and moved things around and came back the second year. And that's when we went to Water SL for the first test. I was like, holy shit, this feels like a different car. Like it was yeah. amazing. And yeah, it, it just it just shows cars take development and every driver is different. So that's just, it's just like anything, you know, it's like WRC, Calais car is different to Taka's car. Like they all, they all run different setups to suit a driver's st- style. So mm-hmm. I feel like it's just refining that and, and we're making progress every single event. The team are great to work with. Um, they they take ideas on board. Um, so I, I feel like we're, we're going to have a very good feeling, comfortable car within a, a very short space space of time. Do you, are you are you feeling any pressure to like win New Jersey? Because like obviously, you know, Vaughn gets a win, Chelsea's getting a win, you know, you're kinda up next. Yeah, it's I feel like different cars have different strengths and different places. Um I felt strong in Orlando. I felt like if if we got past Chelsea we had a, a at least a good shot at the podium. Mm-hmm. Um like Chelsea was on fire. He was driving like a madman. Yeah, he was. And it all worked out. Like he took some huge chances and they worked out. Um, mm-hmm. So New Jersey, it's a track I haven't been to. So it's very hard to say, oh yeah, that track's going to... At the end of the day, I think it's kind of, it's like a big burnout box in Irwindale. You know what I mean? It's it's quite a small track. So I don't think it's going to be the most challenging from a driver's point of view. I feel like it's going to be whoever can get their car the fastest, which is, you know, a bit of a shame because that doesn't show the the best skill, in my opinion, um, mm. having the fastest car. But that's just the way it is in some tracks. Um, I feel like the so far the car feels amazing on an oval. Like it felt mm-hmm. brilliant in Orlando. I felt comfortable from the first lap, and yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to the next or or next oval so um seattle i, I guess so, which is quite quite, quite yeah. a bit away but i love that track anyway and yeah i feel like the cars work very well on on ovals so new jersey we'll go there try our best um if the car has the the speed and the grip i feel like we'll be very good i just don't know because i haven't felt it there yet yeah yeah i mean i i can't i, I don't think there's any track that's like not suited for for those cars but yeah, yeah it's it's definitely there's not a lot to it obviously but yeah to say pressure i think pressure no because you just can't predict drifting so you can't say i'm gonna come back and win because you're right i know it's worked for some people like chelsea in the past but you know sometimes it's i'm not gonna say it's a fluke when it actually happens but you can never predict how are you gonna predict what the judge is gonna do you know yeah you you might I mean, have won but it depends on like somebody everybody, else's uh, opinion. Everybody remembers when you predict and it's correct. Nobody remembers when you predict and it's incorrect, exactly right. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a good way of looking at it. Um, yeah. So I, I'm aiming for a podium as soon as possible. Like that okay. is the plan, and I feel like we can do it. Like the car can do it. Clearly, um, I know I can do it. We just need a little bit of luck. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe a bit a bit of luck from a judge too might help and uh, see what you can put in there for me Let's I'll see what I can do yeah yeah yeah, yeah. See, see. Get just get, get, get me one podium I'll be happy with that <laughs> checks <laughs> no, on the way no, right <laughs> we, we, we'll get there we'll get there that's good we'll get um, there I guess to to wrap everything up uh, I mean we have a lot I mean the, the vast majority of the people that are listening to this are into drifting, obviously, um, probably drive themselves or or getting into it. What, I guess, what is your biggest piece of advice or biggest message to all of those guys trying to get to your level or even just to FD? Yeah, to get to FD or pro level in general takes 
I think it's going to take everything that whatever that person has, it's going to take it all. Uh, energy, passion, determination. Um, you need the friends to get it started. You know, people to support you, your family, your friends. You can't do this alone. Um, so you need to have the backbone before you take on a challenge like it. It's it's absolutely not easy, um, even though it might seem to look easy for some. But I can promise you, like my journey might have been easier than some people's, but it was not easy. Like in the in the background, blood, sweat, and tears is an understatement. Um, so you need to believe in yourself, uh, chase the dream. If you really believe, you know, you know what it's like in things in life. If you really believe you can do something, you'll probably do it. So if you believe you can't, you might be wasting your time because it's going to get really hard at some point. Um, so at, at multiple points, it's just <laughs> a fact. You're going to yeah. have bad luck with cars. You're going to have uh, things out of your control happen. You know, there's loads of challenges along the way. It's even, it's hard to make a name for yourself to to but it's not impossible if mm -hmm. if you feel like you have the fire you got the skill or willing to put the time in to learn the skill and just to chase that dream all the way you'll get there for sure but nice yeah just follow your dreams give your best shot do all the obvious things watch like i still i used to watch um Taniguchi in his HKSS 15 in Japan. I was like, how does that guy make it look so easy? Yeah. I was like, he looks like he is, he looks like he's just cruising and the wheel is just flying so from calm. side to side. And I love that. And I, I based a lot of my style around that at the start. So trying to set the car up to be really smooth on transitions and snap nice and things like that. Um, Cause I, I just loved watching his onboards. Um, so watch as much onboard footage as you can use the same if you can because it's a, a cheap way of, of getting seat time and it will translate to when you do go on track because you're going to learn basics like how do I link this straight to that corner how do I run a wide line how do I transition fast what's happening when I do this you can practice all of that for hours on the sim and it really helps with people starting off and uh yeah, just slowly build it up. There's so much information on the internet nowadays. Um, if you're willing to put the time and effort in, you can make it happen. Yeah, you don't have to dig through the Driftworks forums anymore. It's it's all there. No, no, no. That's uh, that's going back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there wasn't as much dirt in that forum as I was hoping for. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's all Yeah, uh, is that my S14, my, my spec of my, what's it, 370 six horsepower s14 or yep. something yeah, i have a good memory was, for weird things yeah it's it's i mean I can, i'm glad i can you're remember battles out. i can remember tracks battles um i'm very good with car sounds as well oh interesting we'll have to try that at some point see if yeah. we can see if we can isolate some sounds and play it back for you and see if you can figure yeah, out what yeah, it is. yeah 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 would be yeah. good fun but I'd yeah try that. It just it just shows how much i'm hmm. um, obsessed with the sport obsessed yep yeah Obsessed, I think, is the is the best way to put it. Yeah. Well, well um, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, Pleasure, man. You're definitely on on my top list, and I still feel terrible for canceling the first time. Uh, don't worry. Honestly, it good. kind of it worked out it worked better out. because yeah. I, I was at Chelsea and Chelsea's place, and they were kind enough to let me stay for a few days. And I'm like, ah, oh, like I'm I need to barge into one of his rooms and set up here. Yeah, it's all good be chatting for a couple of hours so no it's it's all good it's all good no, appreciate it yeah well yeah um well for everybody listening at home thank you thank you for listening thank you for watching uh if you don't follow james for some reason already make sure to do that we'll, we'll have links down below i i think it was interesting that you edit your own vlogs you're doing a great job there's somebody who edits video all the time um, oh yeah I, I, it's tough huh i still use it's iMovie not, i'm that basic no yeah really? I just, i'm not upgrading like my <laughs> vlogs are telling a story what happened 
I mean, it just shows. And yeah. close it out. Like it just shows it doesn't matter the the equipment. It's just what you do with it. Yeah. Right? So so I get uh, if I'm in Europe, I get a media guy to like cut me a, a nice montage with a bit of music from the outside. And the same mm. in the US, the RTR media team just uh, yeah. cut a few bits together, a bit of music, and the rest is just a GoPro and sometimes a selfie camera on my phone. Um, that's crazy. all the basics. Ah, it's just yeah. telling a story, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. And I, yeah. I must thank uh, Becky for teaching me how to to uh, edit a youtube video that's what we that's what we learned in covid year so 2020 i learned how to edit and just started nice. doing random youtube videos she's going to be more famous than you are soon i, I hope oh, you know that quick yeah. Yeah. yeah it's happening fast yeah yeah cool sure. well thanks again um yeah thanks again for everybody listening uh hopefully the clips that come out of this are pretty good that's always my my concern um yeah, and I guess I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, man. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks, everyone, for supporting Drifting. And let's keep it going. Sweet.